Good morning, church. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, if I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm extremely exhausted. Uh, I had a baby girl born on like three weeks ago, tw- the 22nd of December. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, I did a lot of work. It was all me. No, it was all my wife. Uh, it's really unfair what us men do for the child and what women have to do for the child. That is evident in me. But I'm extremely tired and exhausted. And um, I am looking forward to my Sunday nap. This is what I'll be looking forward to after I'm done with you guys. If we have that slide of my uh, me and my child sleeping. Yes, there we go. That is gonna be my afternoon. Hopefully if she will go down for a nap. Um, but uh, her favorite spot is my chest. So uh, I'm really glad that I put in a lot of work in raising her so far. And while she does not like my wife's chest, she prefers my chest. It's a bane of our marriage right now. But uh, little Remy Evangeline loves sleeping on her dad, so I am in absolute heaven, so I cannot wait to get done with church so I can get home to my daughter. Uh, And here's another photo of my daughter because you guys asked for it. Uh, There she is in all of her glory, six pounds, three ounces, huge baby. Just kidding, she's tiny. Um, So uh, that has been my reality for the last couple weeks, so I'm getting used to not having sleep. So if uh, this sermon does not make sense, it's not me, it's her. So email her at remy at nscbellingham.com. Dana, we have that email up for her, right? Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, All right, so uh, today we are gonna take a break from the Gospel of Mark and we're gonna be focusing in on spiritual practices. Uh, In today's culture, if you ask someone how their day has been or how the week has been, chances are you came into church and someone asked, hey, how, how you been? You typically respond with good, but busy. Uh, We always respond with busy. You ask anyone how they are doing, they will respond with, well, it's good. Life is good, but we're just busy. We're really busy. We've got a lot of things going on. Why do we respond that way? Uh, Because busy equals important. Important people are busy, so we are busy. And if we are not busy, we will lie and say that we have been busy. But busyness uh, is a detriment to our spiritual lives. Um, Busyness does not help us with our relationship with God. It actually undermines our relationship with God. We live in a day and an age where we are distracted. We are numb to bad fe- all the bad feelings. If you can't sleep, you take melatonin or NyQuil, or if you're like me, you take them both to really knock yourself out, and then your wife is worried that you're gonna overdose on melatonin, and you go, I Googled it, I don't think you can o- overdose on melatonin, and she's still concerned about it, but if you can't sleep, you take melatonin. If you can't ha- find happiness, what do you do? You go and you scroll on TikTok, or you go and you look at Instagram. If you feel lonely, you go and watch Friends. Why? Because you feel like you have that community. You're like, my friend Chandler is so funny. Joey's an idiot, but he gets with the ladies. You feel like you have these communities on the internet, but you actually don't. So what is the, uh, we have a solution for everything. Everything is instant. Everything is now. Uh, We live in an instant entertainment culture. If you're bored, you can go on Netflix. If you can't find a show on Netflix, you go to Amazon Prime. If you can't find something on Amazon Prime, you go to HBO Max. If you can't find that one, you go to Peacock. If you can't find something on there, you go to some other Tubi or some obscure streaming service, or you go on YouTube. We have entertainment solutions for everything. If you want something, you see, see an advertisement for some cool new sneakers, hashtag night you go and you order them online. They can be at your house in two days or less. Anything you want, you can buy uh, in two days or less. The American dream is not what it used to be. The American dream used to be, I want a house in the suburbs for a family. I want the simple life, uh, white picket fence, you know the dream, but the American dream of, ye- that is the American dream of yesteryear. The American dream now is hedonism. Uh, hedonism is I want pleasure and I want it now. We want a dopamine hit every 10 minutes. And if we're not getting that dopamine hit, we'll find it in some place, somewhere, somehow. We are in a day and age where uh, yeah, we have everything you could possibly need for life and we're getting close to the place where we will have everything that you desire. We're on the brink of having everything we could possibly desire, but yet society is still fractured. Uh, Suicide rates do not go down year by year. Suicide rates go up year by year. Antidepressant medicine has not been on the decline. It's on the uh, increase year after year. Mass shootings are not going down, they're going up. So what is going on in society? We are trying to find happiness and fulfillment in things we ought not to be finding happiness 
happiness and fulfillment. And so today we're gonna be looking in to spiritual practices, two mainly spiritual practices that will help us cultivate a life of contentment and joy with God, not apart from God, but with God. And so uh, the solution to all these issues in society is this. We are made in the image of God, meaning that God knows how we are wired and how we are made. And he knows how we ought to order our lives in that way we can have a happy and fulfilled life. Now that's not prosperity gospel, that's just living within the margins of the Bible. And God has written how we are supposed to order our lives according to his word. And so, we oftentimes go and try to find happiness in things we ought not to find happiness. This can, if you're lonely, you go and try to find that happiness in porn. If, you, uh, if you're looking for sexual intimacy, you find it in porn. If you hate your coworker, you find it in slander. Those are things that are contrary to the way of God and those are things that God caused sin. And so uh, we're gonna talk about things that actually create uh, life and joy and peace in your life. And those two things that we're gonna be focusing in on are one, the Sabbath, what is the Sabbath? Why do we Sabbath? How do we Sabbath? Uh, what is the Sabbath? And then the second one is gonna be silence and solitude. What is silence and solitude? How do you practice it? Why you ought to practice it? So we're gonna be introducing those two spiritual practices. These are found in the Gospels. These are found throughout the Bible. And so I hope to sketch the biblical narrative of both those spiritual practices and implement them into your life and how to do them for you guys today. You guys with me? Okay, cool. You guys didn't tune me out. I'm glad. Uh, all right, so let's start with Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath, uh, what is the Sabbath? The word Sabbath is, uh, the Hebrew word is Shabbat. Can you guys say Shabbat? Wow, you guys are so good at foreign languages. Uh, which means cease, rest, complete rest, or desist uh, is found in every section of the Bible. It's found in the creation narrative. It's found in the 10 commandments. It's found in the epistles. It's found in the gospels. The Sabbath is found throughout the entirety of the Bible. It's, uh, it's mentioned 104 times in the Old Testament alone. And so let's look at some biblical texts on defining the, the Sabbath and how to structure out the Sabbath. So the first text we're gonna look at is Genesis chapter two, verses one through three. Now, some context to this verse. This is God right after he created the entire world. And this is what he does on the seventh day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the, ho and the, all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done. So that's the introduction of Sabbath, this day of rest. Next passage comes from the 10 commandments. Exodus 20 verses nine through the first part of 10. Six days you, sh you shall labor and, and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it, you shall, not, you, you shall not do any work. And then we get Jesus in the gospels talking about the Sabbath. Mark two, verses 27 through 28. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a day to stop from work, to, to not work. It's a, it's a day, meaning it's a 24 hour period and it happens every seven days, meaning it happens every week. So the Sabbath is a day to quit working every seven days for a full 24 hour period. How the Jews would practice this was they would go from sundown to sundown. So dinner time to dinner time. And so that's how my wife and I, we choose to practice Sabbath is we do sundown to sundown. We, we normally have a meal together. Uh, sometimes we get together with Tay and Marissa and have uh, a Sabbath dinner together. And then we go, go and have our Sabbath alone. But uh, more on how to Sabbath uh, towards the end. Why do we Sabbath? Okay, so now we know what Sabbath is. Why should you Sabbath? So A.J. Sabota, uh, in his book, Subverting Sabbath, which is a great book you guys should read, uh, he's, he answers the question on why you should Sabbath this way. Why do we Sabbath? Um, Gen Genesis says we Sabbath first because God kept a Sabbath and second because God built it into the DNA of creation and it is therefore something creation needs in order to flourish. So let's start with the Genesis story. First, 
because the Bible says so. We should Sabbath because the Bible said so. Says so. In Genesis 2, we already read this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from his work that he had done. Now, it's important to note that this is right, this is on the seventh day. Us as humans, Adam and Eve, were created on the sixth day. So they're, they're, uh, the, the first day with God was the Sabbath day. And so first impressions are kind of a big deal. I don't know if you guys know that or not. That might be news to you guys, but first impressions are kind of a big deal. Uh, when you go into a job interview, you don't wear a beanie. You don't wear like sl- a flannel. You, you wear like your best outfit. You go and get a fresh haircut. You put on a suit. You, 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 you shave your face. You make sure you look good. Why? Because you wanna make a good first impression. When you meet your girlfriends or your wife's parents for the first time or your boyfriends or your husband's parents for the first time, you, you don't try to be a slob. You try to put your best foot forward. I remember the first time I met Mary's parents. Uh, I was like a nerd and I was so nervous about it. I wrote down an index card of conversation points to have with them. Like I knew her, her father-in-law, I knew uh, her dad was uh, a volunteer firefighter. So I'm like, okay, look up facts about firefighters so that way I can talk to him about firefighting. Like, uh, because I wanted to make a good first impression. And so first impressions are a big deal. When you go out on a first date, you want to make a a good first impression. First impressions are huge. Uh, According to science, we make up our minds about someone, not in the first second, but in the first hundredth millisecond of meeting someone. So that's before words can even be exchanged. If I see you walking through the door in the back, I've already made up my mind about you. And you're going, wow, Andrew, that's really hard. So I'm like, hey, you do it too, okay? It's not just me, we all do it. We make up our minds about someone when we first see them. And so Adam and Eve's first impression of God was that he rested. The first whole day they spent with God was the seventh day, meaning God rested. So the first importance to God is of rest. He didn't go, hey, go work the field. Don't go work the garden. Let me place you in the garden. The whole first day was them resting with God. And so that the whole First impression with God was resting for a whole day. The, the second reason to Sabbath, again, is because it makes the top 10 list for God. So there's this thing in the Old Testament called the 10 Commandments that you learn about in Sunday school. Uh, and it's basically the top 10 moral laws of God, like thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not do this, that, and the other thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's the list that we love to, to say to people. Uh, thou shalt not worship other gods. Thou shalt not commit adultery, sleeping with someone who's not your spouse. Thou shalt not lie, things like this. Th- these are things that are in the 10 Commandments. And the Sabbath makes that top 10 list for God. Uh, but the, the Sabbath is different in that list. It doesn't say thou shalt not, meaning it's not news to these people. All, all the other 10 commandments are coming as news. Like this is new information to the people. They didn't know these things before. Like God's like, hey, just to let you guys know, you guys shouldn't murder people. They're like, oh God, we didn't know that. I'm glad you told us. Sweet, sweet, thanks. So all these other things are coming as news to them, except for the Sabbath. The Sabbath starts off with this. And in Exodus 20, verse eight, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Remember, it doesn't say, hey, this is news to you guys. It's like, hey, you guys are already doing this. Remember it, hold to it, remember the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath is a huge deal. It, it's biblically true that we should practice the Sabbath, but also it's hardwired into our DNA and how we were created that we should practice the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus says this in Mark 2, verse 27 through 28, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, meaning that the Sabbath is for our benefit, not for our detriment. It's for uh, our benefit, meaning it, it, it will be a help to us, not a detriment to us. Uh, to illustrate this point, uh, in 1793, France was on the brink of a revolution uh, in, in industry, and they were like, hey, we need production to go up. So they had this revolutionary idea. And so for those those of you who don't know history, France is huge on revolutions. They've had like 50 of them. Uh, and so France, uh, during this revolution, they're like, we have a great idea. Uh, let's change the work week from seven days to 10 days. And they're like, okay, let's roll out a new calendar. They re- roll out the new firefighter calendar with a 10 day work week. They, they roll out new clocks. They did the whole shebang. They're like, we're gonna move to a 10 day work week instead of seven day work week. So that way people work 10 days and have one day off instead of seven days. So that way people will work more and will be more productive as a society. It will be better for France as a whole. 
it will work, right? What could go wrong? Well, it failed miserably. What happened was um, suicide rates skyrocketed. People ended up just quitting their jobs and homelessness spiked and also production decreased. It did not make things more productive. It decreased productivity. And so there's been countless studies around the Sabbath, whether it's a benefit or not. And there's still being studies done that prove that Sabbath is for our benefit, meaning that if you practice the Sabbath, your productivity does not go down, but it actually goes up. Having a full day of rest actually helps you work better those other six days or five days of the week versus not having that day of rest. So if you go 10 days, you're like, man, I'm way more productive. I'm working 10 days a week you're actually not gonna be more productive. You're gonna be more productive if you actually practice the Sabbath. And so the question remains, is it sin not to Sabbath? If you do not practice the Sabbath, is it sin? Now pausing for dramatic effect. What do we think? Is it sin if you don't practice the Sabbath? Yes, I would say it is sin if you do not practice practice the Sabbath. Now, let me nuance that real quick. Uh, That sounds really harsh, but let's define what sin is. Sin is human activity that is contrary to the will of God. So would we say that Sabbath is the will of God? Absolutely. Sabbath is God's will for humanity that we practice the Sabbath. Just like it's God's will not for us to lie. It's God's will not for us to slander. It's God's will for us to worship him. It is God's will for us to practice the Sabbath. So it is absolutely sin if we do not practice the Sabbath. And we'll get more into what it looks like to practice the Sabbath here in a little bit. But we need to pause to go into the spiritual practice of silence and solitude. So the the spiritual practice of silence and solitude is simple in the how, but is difficult in its execution. So what is the spiritual practice of silence and solitude? It is very simple. It's being silent. So uh, how do you do it? You guys get it? You guys get it? That's how you do it. You just be silent. So uh, how, how do you practice silence and solitude with God? By being silent with God. So for me, how I practice silence and solitude most often is I just go, all right, hey, God, speak to me. And I just am silent. I don't say anything. I try to focus my mind and my heart and on God. And I set a timer so that way I know how much time has passed because I'm a, an American and I have to have things in order. Uh, and I'm also crazy and, uh, or OCD about time. Um, so that's how you practice. But it's hard in the execution. Why? Because we don't want to be silent. We don't want to be alone with our thoughts. We want to have information coming at us at all times. When was the last time you got in your car and you drove anywhere without the radio being on or or your iPhone playing? When was the last time you did the dishes without music playing in the background? We all have an Alexa, it's super easy. You go, hey Alexa, play such and such music and she's instantly playing it. So when was the last time you actually had a moment of silence in your life where you didn't have anything going on where you're like, hey, I'm just gonna drive through this spot and utter silence. I'm not going to turn on the radio. I'm just going to be alone with my thoughts. If you're anything like me, this is like non-existence. You have to work at it because we are afraid to be alone with our thoughts. We are afraid to be alone with God. Uh, We're afraid that our anxiety will spike if we're alone with our thoughts and we'll have to uh, deal with all those thoughts and everything. But let's Before we get into that, let's pause and go into the biblical theology, the biblical narrative around silence and solitude. Uh, The main passage that always gets played for silence and solitude is Psalm 46, verse 10. And this is a very famous uh, verse. If you're anything like me, uh, your mom has a uh, thing on the wall with this verse on it or a coffee mug on it. Uh, Psalm 46, uh, 10 says this, be still and know that I am God. And so it's a very popular verse, but it gets lost uh, because this Psalm is talking about God is our refuge, meaning that there's calamity, there's hardship, there's bad things happening all around us. And God is speaking to the people of Israel, be still and know that I am God. Uh, This is uh, the... uh, the scene in the movie, I, I don't know what movie this is in. It's kind of like a trope that's in a bunch of movies, but you know, like that scene where it's like, someone's like freaking out, like something bad is happening. They're like, oh my gosh, the, 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 the meatballs are falling from the sky, like clouding the chance of meatballs and like freaking out. They're like, what do we do? What do we do? And mostly like the, the protagonist of the movie who like grab a hold of them and smack them across the face and go, get a hold of yourself, man. And they kind of like, figure, they like, the slap kind of gets them right, right in the frame of mind. They go, okay, let's do it. And they go out and they conquer and they win the day and everything's great. 
great because of the, the slap. And so uh, in this Psalm, this is God basically slapping the people of Israel going, hey, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And so in the, to get specific into this verse, uh, verse 10, the, the, the Hebrew word be still is rafa, which means to release or to let go. So it's meaning, hey, you're not in control. God is in control. Let go and let God be in control. And throughout this Psalm, if you have your Bible, you will see throughout this Psalm in Psalm 46, off to the right, you see this little word called selah. And basically what selah means is to pause or to be silent or to reflect. And so what Selah is getting at throughout this psalm is, hey, pause and reflect. Take a breath, slow down, take a breath. And so the psalms were actually, the songs that were sung in the, in the temple uh, dur during this time. So these were actually like the worship songs. These are the hymns of the day. These are, these are the songs that they would worship to. And so they would actually, in this psalm, when they're doing Psalm 46 in the temple, they're, they're singing and then they get to the Selah and they literally cut out all the music and they are paused and they are silent for a moment. And so in this psalm, it is pausing and reflecting and being still and knowing that he is God. Be still and know that he is God. Say law, pause, reflect, refrain. Jesus practiced silence and solitude throughout his entire ministry. Uh, Luke 5, 16 says this, but Jesus often, often withdrew to the, own, to the lonely places and prayed, meaning it was his custom. He did this thing often. He, it wasn't a one-time occurrence. He did it often, time and time again. He went and withdrew to the lonely places and prayed. He embraced silence and solitude. Uh, right before Jesus' death, he knew what he was walking into. Well, what, what did Jesus do? He didn't run and preach a sermon. He didn't run to a priest. He didn't run to his friends. What did he do? In Luke twenty two forty one, 41, it says this, he withdrew about a stone's throw away beyond them and knelt down and prayed. He withdrew. He went to the silent and the solitude place. In Luke 4, 1, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when, when he is baptized and the, and the dove descends upon him and the clouds depart and the heavens are torn open, the voice comes from heaven, with you, my son, I am well pleased. What did Jesus do immediately after that? Did he go and preach a sermon? Did he go and do miracles right after that? No, he went out into the wilderness. Luke 4, 1 says, Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was left by the Spirit into the wilderness. And so often many of us will be like, hey, I do not have time for silence and solitude. You don't know my life. Uh, I have a brand new newborn baby that cries her head off. I cannot have silence and solitude. I got toddlers. I do not have time for silence and solitude in my life. Uh, and I would just want, I wanna push back a little bit against that. Uh, Jesus changed the world in three years. Uh, his public ministry was from the time he was like the age of 30 was when he was like baptized to, and he died about uh, when he was like 33 years of age. And so in those three years, Jesus embraced Sabbath and he embraced science and solitude as margins in his life. And he completely changed the world in those three years. And so for you going, man, I don't know, work is just kind of busy. Uh, my life is kind of hectic right now. I just don't really have time for this. You're, del you're delusional. Jesus changed the world in three years and he had time for this. I don't think you're gonna change the world in the next three years. So I think you have time for silence and solitude and Sabbath, okay? So you have no excuse. Um, so biblically, we know uh, we should practice silence and solitude. And for uh, some of us, we're like, man, I would love to embrace silence and solitude, but we don't. Why? Because we are scared to embrace silence and solitude. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 21 says, our God comes, he does not keep silent. Before him is a devouring fire, fire and around him, a mighty tempest, meaning that God consumes sin and we're scared to be alone with our thoughts because God would know our sins and he would start, start to work on their sins. Psalm 139, verse 23, um, David prays this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. We are terrified to be alone with our thoughts because God would search us and he would know us and we're terrified of what he would discover. We know that if we were alone with our thoughts, the montage reel of, uh, of our mistakes would start playing in our heads. The, the dumb mistake we made in high school, that dumb mistake we made last week, that dumb thing we said at work would start coming to the surface and we have to come face to face with that and we don't want to. We'd rather be numb to that pain and distract ourselves. The sin habit that you have become numb to, that lying, that gossip habit that you're just okay with, that porn addiction that you're okay with, you, God would actually press in on that and it would hurt and you wouldn't know what to do with that pain and you're like, I'd rather just numb myself and distract myself than actually embrace that pain. You're scared to hear 
the still small voice of God convicting you of sin. You're terrified of God pressing in with the gospel into your life. By that, I mean the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us of sin. And through the conviction of sin, uh, we are aware of a sin. And through the power of Christ, we get to live in newness and overcome that sin because of the work, not of us, but because of Christ. And we are scared if we are silent that that conviction would come. And we're scared that we might actually not get that breakthrough. And, or we're scared that we might actually get that ba- breakthrough and we have to say goodbye to that sin. So some of you are scared to hear God speak to you. You're terrified that what if God speaks to me? What, what do I do with that? My theology doesn't have a framework for that. What do I do if God actually speaks to me? And so, uh, and some of you are going, man, I would love God to speak to me. I've never heard the voice of God. I would love to hear the voice of God. Science and solitude is your friend. It's a great way for God to speak to you. John Clemacus, uh, uh, church father, he says this, the friend of silence draws near to God. Be still and know that I am God. And so uh, in relationships, oftentimes when we first get into relationships, it's a lot of conversations. Uh, When you first become friends with someone, uh, there's a lot of conversation points. There's not a whole lot of silence. When you go on a first date with someone, it's conversation after conversation. I remember when Mary and I went on our first date, it was like, oh, hey, like, what's your plan for life? What's your calling? What's your purpose? You're like trying to have all these big conversations. She's like, she's like, what's your favorite color? And I'm like, green. She's like, my favorite color is green. And I'm like, okay, is your real favorite color green? Are you just saying that because you're like, we're, we're just liking each other and we're trying to prove that we're alike. Uh, and so when you first get into a relationship with someone, it's a ton of conversation. But as the relationship grows and develops, uh, there's more and more time for silence. When Mary and I first got together, our first dates were filled with conversations. we I remember one time uh, I got... Uh, I was over at her house until like 3 a.m. because we were just talking. Nothing happened for the record. We were just talking to 3 a.m. Like, because we love to talk to each other. And so, and we both had the gift of gab. Um, But as a relationship grows and develops, silence starts to introduce itself into the relationship. Mary and I, when we go out on dates now, there's a whole lot of silence. Sometimes we go, go out to dinner and we're like, we're just people watching. We're just people watching the whole time. We're going, man, those people are obviously on the first date because the guy's like doing this with his hand. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I bet it's like 250. Yeah. He's like trying to prove himself and me and Mary are just watching and like the waitresses are probably like, man, this couple does not talk to each other. They seem really mad. I'm like, no, we're completely happy with each other. It's just we're so comfortable with each other that we can have silence in our relationship. So as a relationship grows, more and more silence introduces itself. Harry Styles in his song from Dining, Dining Tables, he's reflecting on a love lost. And he's, he has this line to say, uncomfortable silence is so overrated. Basically what he's getting at is his love, the, the person he loved had moved on into a relationship and they have uncomfortable silence, meaning that they're okay with being silent with each other. And he's saying, man, that's so overrated. Uh, like uh, she's moved on to a better relationship. I wish I had that. He's lamenting the fact that he doesn't have comfortable silence. And so Richard Plass, he says this about embracing silence and solitude within our relationship with God. But over time, when there is a maturing love in a marriage or a friendship, a growing space of silence develops. And so as we embrace silence and solitude with our relationship with God, our relationship with God starts to mature. Do you have a mature relationship with God? Are you immature in your relationship with God? Are you allowing silence with God? When you're alone with God in the mornings, are you constantly playing worship music and reading the Bible? Are you allowing God to actually search you? Are you praying Psalm 139, search my heart, oh God? Are you allowing silence? Are you allowing God to speak to you? Are you allowing silence with your relationship with God? Are you like a new believer and you and God just started dating and you're like, I have to fill up this conversation. All right, God, I'm gonna read a whole book of the Bible. Here we go. We're gonna go through a whole book. Okay, God, I got my list of prayer. I'm gonna write down all my prayer requests. Okay, God, we're good. And you go on with your day. Are you allowing silence and solitude? Are you allowing pause and reflection within your relationship with God. And there is an aftermath to silence and solitude. If we practice silence and solitude, there's some benefits that will come from it. And if we don't practice silence and solitude, there's some things that, there's some ramifications that will happen. Um, And so if we do not practice silence and solitude, 
uh, if we have that list, um, there, there is a ramification for it. We start to feel distant from God. We start to live our spiritual lives, not from our own spiritual relationship with God, but we live vicariously through other people. By this, I mean, you start listening to sermons. You, you turn on Matt Chandler every week and you're like, man, Matt Chandler is such a great preacher. I mean, I'm just gonna listen to Matt Chandler. I'm gonna listen to John Mark Comer. I'm gonna listen to these preachers. I, I'm gonna go and turn on Jesus' image. I'm gonna go listen to Upper Room. I'm gonna just live vicariously through this podcast, through Bible Project or whatever it may be, instead of getting it directly from the source. And so you start living vicariously through other people, not through your own relationship with God. And you start to feel distant from God. Uh, we feel distant from ourselves. You start to lose uh, your, your identity and calling. You start to lose the fact that you are a child of God, that God loves you and wants a relationship with you. You start to lose the fact that God has called you to do something. God, God has a specific calling on each one of us. He's not calling someone else to your calling. He's calling you to your calling. You start to lose sight of that the more and more distant you get from God, the more and more you allow noise into your life. You feel anxious. Uh, you, you start to feel exhausted, longing for rest, longing for sleep. Uh, you feel the need for escape. You, you start turning to things that you know aren't, aren't, aren't actually gonna help you. This is, at the end of the night, you're like, man, I'm so tired. I'm just gonna have a glass of wine. It's just one glass of wine. Pretty soon that glass of wine turns into five glasses of wine. And before you know it, you have an issue. Uh, you, you turn to things like a new TV show. You go, man, there's a new episode of this. There's a new season of this on, on a binge. I wanna distract myself. I wanna numb myself. Or you're going, man, I just need a nap. I need to take a Sunday nap. I need to sleep. Or I, I wanna scroll through social media. I wanna distract myself or you're feeling lonely and you're longing for intimacy and you turn to pornography and you this starts a sin cycle of feeling worse and worse. The pain of silence only grows more and more you're away from it. Emotional health takes its toll. toll. You are quick to anger. You are reactionary. You're not active. Uh, you start living from a surface of, of your lives, not from the depths of who you are. You're, you're a shadow of what you used to be. And so this is what happens if you do not brace silence and solitude. If you're constantly in allowing noise into your life. This is what happens. So what happens if you start to embrace silence and solitude? There, there's a huge benefit. So if we have that side of, if you do embrace these things, you start to find a quiet place. This could be a park down the street. Uh, this could be uh, a rigging nook in your house. This could be your morning routine. For me, it's my morning routine. Uh, for me, I wake up each morning and I make some toast uh, and I am, uh, this was, prove my maturity. I have Nutella chocolate toast uh, every morning and I down it with not a glass of milk, but a glass of chocolate milk. And so that is my morning routine. I'm 28 years old. I pay the bills. I can afford chocolate milk. And so I treat myself every morning to this morning routine of chocolate. And I want, I probably will have diabetes here in a few years, but it's okay. Uh, but this is my morning routine and it's sacred to me. I, I, I have this toast. Uh, I, I read the scriptures. I read, I listen to music. This is a time for me to have quiet before uh, the day begins. And right now it's a little difficult with a three week old in the house who all of a sudden starts crying and I'm going, hey, don't you know, this is my quiet time. You're not supposed to interrupt this, but we're, we're working through it. We're working through it. I'm talking to her about it. Um, she's not understanding me though. But uh, so we start to find these quiet places. We start to take time. Coming home from a busy day, you take time to decompress. This may take five minutes or an hour or two, but we take the time. And so for me right now with having a wife and a child, I cannot come home and be like, hey babe, I had a stressful day. I just need a minute to go into the bedroom and decompress. I don't have that luxury. And probably most of you are probably in the same boat as I am. And so for me, it's my sacred drive home from work. So like after church today, I'll get home and I'll drive back to Linden where we live. In that 30 minutes, I'll just not have any music playing. I just kind of go, okay, I just need to process some things so that way I can come home rejuvenated and I can slow down and come back to what I, I need. And so that leads us to our next one. We slow down, you take a breath, you come back to the present, realizing the word, world is going on without us. We are not rushed. When you come to a stoplight uh, on the way home, you're not instantly going to your phone for Instagram. Uh, don't look at me like that. We all do it, okay? You all go, you, you come to a stop sign, you go, oh man, I'm bored. I'm gonna go scroll through Instagram. Then the car honks behind you, you go, oh crap. And you drop your phone and you wonder why you have a crack on your screen. Um, so you, you slow down, you take a minute, you take a breath, you take those little moments of sacred space and you go, 
okay, I'm gonna take this moment and just reflect on God. You start to feel not just the good feelings, but all of them. You start to embra em embrace the, the, the good feelings, the joy, the gratitude, the celebration, the restfulness, but also you embrace the bad ones, anxiety, anger, and doubt, and you actually deal with them. You begin to learn how to feel. You're no longer a zombie or a robot. You embrace emotion. Emotion is your friend, men. It's okay to cry, okay? I cry. What? Sorry, I wasn't supposed to say that. Uh, we face the good, the bad, and the ugly of our hearts. Our worries, our depression, our hope, our desire for God, our lack of desire for God, our sense for God's presence, our sense for his absence, our fantasies, our realities, all, all the lies we believe, the truth we com come home to, our motivations, our addictions, the coping mechanisms we reach uh, to to make, make it through the week. All this is exposed and painfully so. But rather than leaking it out onto those we love, we expose it to the loving Father. And so silence and solitude allows us not to be angry at those we love, but express that to the Father who knows the, the inner workings of our hearts and can actually deal with it. And so, uh, and also with this, we we start to hear God. We start to hear God speak to us. The noise around us is no longer a concert of loud percussions, but is a meadow of God, a meadow of daisies of God speaking to us. And you're hearing the still, quiet, small voice of God. And so this is silence and solitude. Silence and solitude should be embraced on a daily basis, multiple times throughout the day. Yeah, you can start off small. Um, you don't have to go, man, this is, I'm gonna take an hour every day of silence and solitude. You can start off really small. For me, uh, where I really embrace silence and solitude, this might be TMI, but is in the shower. Uh, I embrace silence and solitude in the shower. It's a great moment just for me to sit there and be like, God, search me, know my heart. God, I, I have these desires. I don't wanna have these desires. Search me, press into me. And so take these little five minute chunks throughout the day of just pausing and reflecting and saying say law to God and be like, okay, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna reflect. I'm gonna have this interlude with God. And so let's get back to Sabbath. So Sabbath, uh, as we talked about, is a 24 hour day of rest. And we should do it because it's hardwired into our DNA and the Bible also tells us so, like the famous nursery song. I know because the Bible says so. Uh, I think that's it, right? Sunday school? Okay, never mind. All right, so we got four basic... Uh, basic steps for how do you do Sabbath or four principles for how do you do Sabbath. So the four basic principles is stop, rest, delight, and worship. So let's start with stop, stop, stop working. Uh, don't check emails, don't answer phone calls, stop, don't work. Uh, for some of you, you will have to put your cell phone in your gun safe and lock it and somehow not figure out the code in order for this to be the case. But it, you have to stop working. And I don't think I need to nuance what work is. Uh, you know what work is when you see it, so don't work on the Sabbath, okay? So no work, say it with me, no work on the Sabbath. I was trying to make it really long, so it was really hard for you guys to say, but you guys did it well, so, oh well. All right, uh, uh, next one is rest. We hear uh, about Sabbath rest, and we imagine sleeping and taking a day off to chill, but Sabbath rest is a form of resistance. There are powerful forces, both external and internal, that war against the Sabbath spirituality. The Sabbath will require that we resist. So a silly example of resisting to embrace that Sabbath rest is um, for me when I was in college, not in high school, um, uh, cause I didn't do homework in high school. Uh, in college, you have to do homework in order to graduate. But in college, I did homework. And somehow every time when it came to doing my homework, I would be like, you know what I should do? I should reorganize my closet. My, uh, my roommates hate my mess. I'm gonna clean up my mess and I'd do that. And I'm like, okay, now I can sit down and get to work. Uh, I'll get my homework done now. And I go, you know, my car is messy. There's some trash in my, my car. I should probably go take care of that right now or else I'll forget, I'll get back to it. And then, uh, and then before I know it, it's like 6 a.m. and the class is at 7 a.m. and I'm having to do the homework and I'm like cranking it out super sloppily because I didn't resist the temptation to do other things. And so to embrace Sabbath rest, you will have to resist some certain, certain things. Work is not gonna stop calling you. Uh, your kids are not gonna stop, stop needing things. You're gonna need to resist some things in order to embrace embrace that rest. And so to rest, you're gonna have to resist some things. And then number three is delight. De uh, Sabbath is not just one erroneous day of our religious duty, but is a life-giving day of delight. A weekly party is a full day set aside to celebrate our life 
with God in his world, world and is de- it's designed to be done in community, not alone. Few things are more pro- pro- provocative in the modern world than communities of joy. So when we think of Sabbath and we think of the, the aspect of delight, think pleasure stacking. Uh, for Mary and I, one time we, uh, we had the opportunity to do like the ultimate Sabbath. Uh, it was like the Sabbath, like, like if you're grading Sabbath, this is like an A plus plus some bonus points. And so what, uh, what this dream Sabbath looked like is we went out to our favorite restaurant, which is Mambo Italiano in Fairhaven. And uh, we had some really good carbs, a lot of fettuccine Alfredo. I got the salmon, a lot of bread, felt really good. And then we had a gift card to the Chrysalis. So we went immediately from there to the Chrysalis, got, got a couple's massage. Then we went home and slept. And then we played, uh, for me, I love puzzles. And then I did a puzzle like all the next day. And then uh, some friends came over for a UFC fight and we watched the UFC. So for me, that was like my ultimate Sabbath. I was like, man, this is like all my favorite things. I'm getting to date like the hottest woman in the world, which is my wife. And, uh, I'm getting to get a massage and I'm getting to eat some good food and I'm getting to do a puzzle, which is awesome. Uh, and I'm getting to watch people beat, beat each other up. And so uh, for you, this could look differently. Uh, think ple- uh, this is pleasure stacking. This is going and having fun with friends, watching a movie, putt, putt, uh, ax throwing, whatever it may be, playing cards, playing risk, uh, doing a puzzle, whatever you find pleasure, whatever brings you life, you do uh, on this Saturday. Dan Allender, he summarizes Sabbath delight this way. The Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of our lives, without question or thought, is the best day of the week, is the day we anticipate Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the day we remember Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Sabbath is the holy time where we feast, play, dance, have sex within the confines of marriage, sing, pray, laugh, tell stories, read, paint, walk, walk, Watch creation in its fullness. Few people are willing to enter Sabbath and sanctify it and make it holy because a full day of delight and joy is more than most people can bear in a lifetime, let alone a week. And so that leads us to our last and most important aspect of Sabbath. Sabbath has to have worship into it. So Sabbath isn't just a day to stop, rest, and throw a feast in community. Ultimately, it is a holy day set apart and dedicated to God himself. Early Christians called this the Lord's Day. It's a weekly day of worship by which we cultivate in a spirit of worship all week long. And so for me, uh, I, I keep a prayer journal. And so for me on Sabbath day, I go back and I look through my prayers that I prayed that week and see what prayers God has answered. And I praise him and I thank him for it. It creates a posture of gratitude within my life. Uh, and it's also a day where I, if I'm wrestling with some big theological topic, like I'm like, man, I really need to figure out the Trinity today or I need to figure out the kenosis theory. Uh, It's a day where I go and I dig into that and I wanna study theology. That's what I find worship and delight with God is in studying theology for Mary. She's like, that is not where I find delight or joy or uh, pleasing. It does not satisfy my emotions with God. For her, it's spending time worshiping God. So she'll spend time worshiping God. But for each one of us, worship will look different depending on how God has wired and created us. And so figure out how God has wired and created you and participate in worship on your Sabbath day. Worship team, you guys can start making your way up. And so some closing thoughts on Sabbath. Uh, We got five Sabbath truths. Um, First Sabbath truth that we we ought to hold to is uh, Sabbath is not a reward for for hard work, meaning you do not have to earn the Sabbath. Uh, You do not have to work hard for the Sabbath, Adam and Eve on the first day of creation, they got to participate in the Sabbath. And so Sabbath is not a reward for working hard. Sabbath is a reminder that our work will remain incomplete. Your work is still gonna call you. There's still gonna be things that you need to get done, but you still must enter into that Sabbath rest. Sabbath is a reminder that our work will remain incomplete. There's projects still on the table. Uh, You can get to them the next day. Sabbath is a day that moves us from production to presence. It's not about producing, it's about being in the presence of God. Sabbath reminds us that we are not God, that the world still goes on without us, that our communities still go on without us, our work still goes on without us, that we are not God. Sabbath points us to the deeper rest we need in Christ, that it's a day of refreshment with Christ. 
Karl Barth, uh, he, he comments that uh, the Sabbath is uh, ultimately points us to the gospel. And he says this, the Sabbath teaches us that we do not work to please God. God. Rather, we, we rest because God is already pleased with the work he has accomplished in us. And so when we enter into the Sabbath, it's a way of our bodies and our life and our time screaming out the gospel back to us. And so this is a spiritual practice, meaning that, that it takes time. Uh, Michael Jordan uh, did not become Michael Jordan the first time he picked up the basketball. We all know the story. Michael Jordan did not make his varsity team as a freshman, which is like, totally believable because it's like, who makes the varsity team as a freshman? Michael Jordan took time. He had to practice. He had to work at his craft to become what he became. Tiger Woods, the first time he swung a golf club was not the great Tiger Woods that would go on to win the most majors. Uh, it took time and practice. So with this, with, with Sabbath and science and solitude, it takes time. It's gonna take work. It's gonna take years of practicing and you failing time and time again for you to get it right. But start practicing these and watch what God does through Sabbath. Watch what God does through one day of a week of you just dedicating it to, to stopping, resting, to delighting and to worshiping God. Watch what God does in those little moments of silence. Start practicing these things and watch what God does in your life. And so with that communion team, you guys can come forward. We're gonna enter into a time of communion. And what communion is, is uh, it's a display of God's work in us, not us working towards God. It's God going, man, I love you guys so much. I, I came down from heaven uh, to earth to have a relationship with you. This is, God, God, Jesus said when, when, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, uh, he instituted right before his death, he goes, the bread, this is my body broken for you. His body broke for us. This is his, the, the juice, the wine is his blood shed for us. Meaning that he, 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 he's bro he, he shed blood blood for us, meaning he went through pain and agony to have a relationship with us. Christianity is the only religion where God works his way towards us, not us working our way towards God. This is God wanting relationship with us, not us wanting relationship with God. And communion is that, is going, reflecting upon God, man. God broke his body for us. God shed his blood for us. God wants a, a relationship with us. And so as we take communion today, uh, I want us to reflect on the goodness of God, of what God has done in us. And if you can't think of anything, just think of him dying on the cross. That, that enough is enough goodness for a lifetime, but God has done infinitely more in your life. And so as we uh, go into this time of worship and, and uh, taking of the communion, I want you guys to reflect on the goodness of God. And so if you guys wanna stand with me, I'm gonna pray and we're gonna go into a time of communion. And a little caveat to uh, communion, if you are not a believer, if you're not a Jesus follower, uh, I just uh, highly encourage you to stay in your seat. Uh, do not participate in communion. This is only for us who are Jesus followers, that Jesus is Lord and Savior of our life. And if uh, you want Jesus to become Lord and Savior of your life, I would love to pray with you and serve you your first communion. So I'm going to be over to the right. But uh, at this time, we're going to go into a time of communion. So I'm going to pray. You guys are going to exit to the left of, uh, of your aisles and come back to the right. We got communion trays in the front and in the back. So go to the one nearest to you with that. Dear Jesus, we just praise you. We thank you so much for... Um, you, you're, the joy you find in us, that you delight in us, God. We praise you and we thank you that you know how we are wired. You know how we ought to live our lives and you, you have taught it to us. You made it explicitly clear in your word, God. So we just, we praise you. We thank you for your goodness. We praise you and we thank you that you want us to have joy, God. You want us to have happiness and, and, and you are cultivating that within us, God. So I just pray that you just help us to, to seek more of you. Help us to practice following after you more and more, God. So I just pray that you just renew us, God. Help us to understand the gospel in a new way, God. Help us to see your good work. In your name we pray.